So I'm I'm talking about hyperplastic hyperplastic polyps. Uh, and some of you may have heard this talk before, but I buffed it up a little bit. I think it's an important topic, um, and I, I noticed a theme in um, the topics that interest me these days. That is things that I didn't learn about in my residency. So if I didn't learn about it in my residency, what it highlights is that you know being a pathologist means you're always learning, and it's it doesn't end after your residency uh, this this topic I basically you know it evolved after my residency as you I'll, I'll show you from the timeline when I was a resident uh, when I started in 1990 uh, there was just hyperplastic polyps the, this whole concept of serrated neoplasia didn't exist just literally didn't exist so basically you had to teach it to yourself I mean that's how it works in pathology there's a new entity and that's the purpose of the literature and all the annual meetings. You learn about what's becoming, what's new and what's becoming accepted and what you have to do to stay current. So, um, you know, there's some, still some pathologists I would imagine that don't, some senior pathologists that, that don't know the distinction between hyperplastic and sessile serrated. So, um, because they just haven't, you know, they just haven't been um, focusing on, on what's happening in the world of pathology. So ha giving, given that background, um, the topic is hyperplastic, really serrated polyps, and they're not always what they seem. In other words, they've changed. Uh, it used to be one topic, now it's multiple topics. <clears throat> so I start, always start with the case. I like to start with the case. It puts it into perspective. It's like starting any talk with a good joke, but I don't know any good jokes, so I'm just gonna have to start with the case. Um, huh? That that in that was a good joke. Okay, good. A little self self deprecating humor. Um, seven nine year old female. Actually, I think she was the the wife of an oncologist here. Although I'm not sure. It seems kind of old. He doesn't seem that old, but um, that's what I recall. With a 1.2 centimeter polyp in the hepatic flexure, there were several other polyps, both hyperplastic and adenomatous in the splenic and sigmoid, respectively. This is what it looked like. Um, you can see on low power, um, on this side, what would you call that? Just if you were just, you know. Kind of looks hyperplastic, right? And then on this side, what? What do you? What would you? How would you describe that side? Well, it doesn't look the same. Yeah. To me, it looks just solid. There's just solid. It's not. Something's going on on the left side here, right? It's not this. It's something else, right? And as I as I tell you, it's a poorly differentiated carcinoma. On higher power you can see that there's both dysplasia within this seemingly hyperplastic polyp, um, what I would call conventional dysplasia, um, and then you have this poorly differentiated carcinoma with signa ring cells. So <clears throat> this is a good example of a, you know, basically colorectal carcinoma arising in a sessile serrated polyp. Um, and that's the term that I like to use. Sessile, I use the term sessile serrated polyp. I think that's the best. Some people use sessile serrated adenoma. In my reports, I use the term sessile serrated polyp slash adenoma. So you can use any of those three terms. They're all acceptable. But um, when talking about it, I like the term sessile serrated polyp. I think it's the most distinctive. And um, But this is a sessile serrated polyp with conventional dysplasia and a carcinoma. So that raises the question is of what's going on here. I would say in the past, this used to be called an adenoma in which some kind of strange adenoma in which carcinoma arose. We wouldn't say that this arose, hyperplastic polyps were not thought to have any pre-existing uh, or, or any kind of uh, precursor status. So, you know, it begs the question, does carcinoma arise in association with hyperplastic polyps? And if so, 
you know, then do they get the same status as adenomas and all have to be removed? Because right now they, they don't. So, just to give you a little background, it used to be easy. It used to have intestinal type adenomas, conventional adenomas, which were known precursors to cancer. Um, the conventional adenoma to carcinoma sequence worked out by Bert Vogelstein in the 1990s, uh, maybe late 80s. Um, and they were what are known as chromosome unstable. There were alterations, a lot of alterations in tumor suppressor genes, oncogenes, P53, APC, KRAS genes, all of which contributed uh, at some multi, in some multi-step fashion to the development of colorectal cancer. And then you had hyperplastic polyps. On the other side, it was pretty easy. Just two choices whenever you saw a polyp, pretty much. I mean, basically, I'll, I'll get to the long differential near the end, but... Um, but basically, it was either intestinal type adenomas or in hyperplastic polyps. No pre potential and no known genetic alterations. But um, things started to change. So here's your basic tubular adenoma. It forms a nice, you know, polyp, it, meaning it extends upward from the mucosal surface. You can see what's its most prominent feature, I would say. I mean, there's a couple of prominent features. What's that? Hyperchromasia. Hyperchromasia, I think, is the number one. If this was a family feud, I would say 88% <laughs> would say hyperchromasia, given this, given this picture. Um, it's dark. It's much darker than the surrounding normal colonic epithelium. And here you see on hyper, this is dysplasia. Even though you don't, you don't see it start and stop, it's a high power picture, but this is a picture of hyperchromatic nuclei. How do you know it's too dark? You just have to know. You have to see enough not dark to know that this is dark. If you show this to a novice, he would say, well, it looks fine to me. <laughs> but we all know that it's not because it looks dark. And the reason why it looks dark is because hematoxylin has, is, has a stoichiometric relationship with DNA. So when you have more DNA, you have more hematoxylin. And that's how it works. So when you have chromosome instability, you get, you know, autonomous, uh, autonomous um, uh, um, uh, replication of DNA. You have more DNA per nucleus, and that looks dark. That's how it works. I mean, that's how we understand it. Whether that's really how it works, I don't know. But that's how we understand it. That's how we believe how it works. And so tumor cells, that's the basis of all pathology. Really, I mean that that there is some kind of, you know, magic in these stains, and there is because it, it, it it's an inorganic chemical reaction that has to do with the with the amount of DNA. So a dark nucleus means that there's more DNA in there, which is not right. Also, an irregular nucleus is also considered a very important cytologic feature, and the nature of that is less clear to me. I mean, it makes intuitive sense in some way, but the exact relationship is somewhat less clear. But in general, a dark nucleus means more DNA. That's why there's more hematoxylin. But not only are these nuclei dark, but they also, they don't line up properly. They don't respect their neighbor. They overlap. And it's, a, you know, this seems simplistic, but it's, it's important to get a good handle on what dysplasia looks like because it's, probably the most difficult, one of the more difficult things to assess in surgical pathology, along with thyroid neoplasms. When is there dysplasia and when is it kind of reactive atypia? So it's, it's something that you'll always struggle with. So although I'm spending a lot of time on this, it's, it's good that you should too at some point. And then you have the hyperplastic polyp. This is the conventional hyperplastic polyp. Similar to an adenoma, it's raised. It has a, um, a button-like configuration that extends upward from the mucosa. And uh, it's more common in the distal colon. It's usually not pedunculated. It's usually small, less than five millimeters, whereas adenomas can be upwards. They can be, you know, large. Um, and um, it's a, you see these serrations in the surface glands. We'll talk more about that. But there was a shift in the thinking, beginning in the early 80s, when some 
author described, or Mansky described the colorectal carcinoma arising in like what I showed you originally, what was called a mixed hyperplastic tubular adenoma. That's what this would have been called, my case. Uh, mixed hyperplastic adenomatous polyp. And then about six years later, there was a big lag. Obviously, no one paid too much attention to it. Long Acre um, and Finoglia, which are two uh, well-known GI pathologists, described polyps that had the architectural features of hyperplastic, but contained dysplasia, similar to the previous case, and came up with this term serrated adenoma. Terrible name. Mm -hmm. Terrible name because there's so many things that sound like it. But... Um, you know, it has evolved somewhat from there. And then in the mid-90s, and this is, I think, Tarlakovic and Snow are really credited with describing this entity, along with Longacre and Fenoglio, that, um, you know, they had patients with hyperplastic polyposis that also had development of carcinoma, and they didn't look exactly like the conventional hyperplastic polyps. Some of the hyperplastic the quote-unquote hyperplastic polyps in these polyposis syndromes, you know, were more broad-based. They weren't pedunculate. They weren't, they didn't stick up like a button. And then they further characterized and defined Torlakovic and Snover, further defined this concept of a sessile serrated adenoma slash polyp. Um, at the same time, Goldstein and colleagues, uh, again, demonstrated that there were polyps that look like uh, sessile serrated polyps that developed colorectal cancer. So there was increasing evidence that you would, that you're getting cancer arising in these things that were not exactly hyperplastic polyps. They were something else, although they looked similar. So what, what do we have? What's the complete spectrum? So on the left is a hyperplastic polyp. In the middle is a sessile serrated polyp. And on the right is, anybody know? That's a serrated adenoma. So all of them have the term serrated in them. And, but they're, di they're different entities. These two look very similar though. Hyperplastic and sessile serrated look very similar. Serrated adenoma, probably another entity altogether shouldn't really even be in the serrated adenoma, in the serrated um, ca classification scheme because they're something else. They're more like an, it may much more like an adenoma than they are a, a hyperplastic polyp. And then these two are very difficult to distinguish. So we're gonna try and tease them apart. Um, but it, it was established by 2011 that so a subset of these what's called serrated polyps, the, the, the hyperplastic or sessile serrated, led or, or gave rise to colorectal cancer. And then there was a parallel body of evidence that there was a different molecular pathway that corresponded to the, to the sessile serrated polyp to carcinoma sequence. So now we had people saying they see the cancer arising in these things and we also had molecular evidence that this was a distinct pathway so it got people very excited in the world because now we were seeing a different you know a whole different pathway to cancer than the traditional uh, adenoma to carcinoma sequence which had been this which had been in place for decades so they gave a new a new uh, classification scheme Hyperplastic polyp, which you know, which was already in existence, obviously, different types, microvascular and gobletsol are the most common type. Mucin poor, I don't think I've really identified, uh, but they're not subclassified in practice. Sometimes, you know, we used I used to call things colonic mucosa with gobletsol hyperplasia. I don't do that anymore. I just say hyperplastic change, even if it even if it just represents increased number of gobletsols. And then, of course, there's this entity, the sessile serrated polyp. Like I showed you, the traditional serrated adenoma. And there is still this concept of mixed lesions, but um, again, I'm not too familiar with what they ref were referring to there. So again, hyperplastic polyp is the most common of all polyps. It's 90% of all polyps. It's usually in older people, 
but it can be seen in young people. I mean, we all see, I see 50 of these a day. I mean, they're super common. Everybody in this room probably has one. I mean, <laughs> seriously. They're very common. Um, they're usually in the, in, the, in the distal sigmoid, in the distal uh, colon, rectal sigmoid. And they're uh, present in 50%, I would say upwards of 50% of normal individuals, 85% in the Western world. Actually, they, they're less common in the developing countries. And uh, the theory is that they're due to delayed shedding of surface epithelial cells, whatever that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the classic appearance of a hyperplastic polyp is you have this sawtooth internal contour to the lumen. That's the classic, what it means to be hyperplastic, a sawtooth internal contour. And they can go down into the crypts from the surface. They always begin at the, you have to look at the surface of these things because as I'm gonna show you, the base can be look quite hyperchromatic. So a, a common mistake in, 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 uh, you know, in beginning residency is that you look at a hyperplastic polyp and mistake it for an adenoma because you're looking at the base of the crypts. You have to look at the surface. It's the surface that becomes sawtooth. And it goes down, it can go down, but it shouldn't go all the way to the base of the crypts. The base of the crypt should remain narrow and actually hyperchromatic because it, it, it does represent to some degree an increased proliferative state. So you're gonna have cells that are turning over more rapidly in the base and therefore they have more DNA and look dark too. Um, so there should be no dilatation or serration in the lower crypts. That's the key point. Another example, maybe this is like a mucin poor example. Um, it's narrow at the base, dark at the base, but yet the surface has serrations that can go down mid-crypt. Okay, and it talks about this expanded proliferation zone at the base, so it looks dark. That's your typical hyperplastic polyp. And this just shows you the degree of nuclear atypia at the surface. It's mild at, at worst. It's not like the dysplasia, which is darkly hyperchromatic and a lot of nuclear overlap. This is not. And then here's the base where you can see mitotic activity and it looks dark, but this is not adenomatous. This just represents an increased proliferation zone. Um, so the goblet cell hyperplastic polyp, it's less serrated. And like I said, you see this, I see these all the time. It just looks like too many goblet cells without the serrations or less serrations. And um, the mucin pore, like I said, it's hard for me to know what they're talking about on that one. And then we get to the sessile serrated polyp. These represent approximately 15% of the hyperplastic category. So not of all polyps, but of the hyperplastic category. The key thing is, and I think this is one of the key things along with the narrow proliferation zone, is that they're sessile. They're flat. They ne they're not like a button shape. They don't project upward from the mucosa. They are sessile. And um, they can be quite large actually, which was not, you know, not something that we associated with the hyperplastic polyp. They can be mistaken for a prominent mucosal fold, so they're hard to find. Um, they can occur anywhere, but are definitely more common <clears throat> in the right colon, as opposed to, uh, to um, tubular adenomas, which are more common in the left. Uh, there should be no surface cytologic dysplasia, which is counterintuitive because these things can develop cancer, but they don't look like, that's why it took so long to, to believe because the concept of dysplasia to carcinoma was so embedded in our consciousness as pathologists that we just didn't believe if something didn't show dysplasia that it could form cancer, just didn't believe it. <clears throat> and this is what's a, the, the precursor to the colorectal cancer. Um, like I said, it was recently recognized in the context of hyperplastic polyposis. It's, it was increasingly recognized as occurring spontaneously as well. It is the precursor to microsatellite unstable colonic adenocarcinomas. They're large, poorly circumscribed, right-sided. It's kind of a repeat slide. This is really the, the, the paper that brought it out and people, you know, people accepted it from this point on. This was the Terlakovic paper from 2003. And it was an extensive study, and really it's the seminal paper on the subject. 
and you can see here some of the features the top row is low power showing how flat they tended to be a little, some of them look a little button shaped but like look at this look at these they're flat as can be and that's really i find that to be a very helpful feature to, to identify these and and i have to say that any right-sided lesion i kind of look at with a you know with a colored lens because i i want to find that it looks flat because there's more you know the clinicians look at you know they, they have a simplistic view any right-sided lesion is a sessile serrated polyp obviously that's overly simplistic but i try to look at it from their perspective also but you really want to try and look at for the flatness of it um that's important uh, th this is another important characteristic the serrations go all the way down to the base forming a lateral like boot a boot like configuration here see the boots here that's a classic finding as well. If I see that, I call it. Even in one crypt, I'll call it. And then they, they look through all these different, they, the way they did it is they looked at all right-sided versus left-sided polyps that were hyperplastic. And they noticed some key differences. The size was bigger on the right. Um, it had more abnormal proliferation, um, more intraluminal mucin, the architecture, the serration of the crypts was much more intense. Um, it did not have the surface basal membrane that was classic of the thickened surface basal membrane that was classic for hyperplastic polyp. Um, it was just different. The right-sided lesions were different. And this is an endoscopic um, picture of a sessile serrated noma. So it, it's, it, it kind of blends in to the surrounding mucosa. It's hard to pick up and they're much flatter. They, they're poorly circumscribed and they're flat. And here's another view. Um, this is a little bit more, um, again, polypoid, but you can see that the serrations go all the way down forming these like uh, dilated crip bases with some boot formation. So this is, even though this is somewhat polypoid, I would call this without a doubt. Here's another image serrations are um are prominent and it includes the base of the crypts not everywhere these are fine but but here it is so even if it's if you find it in one crypt one base of a crypt that it goes all the way down that's enough uh, if there's crypt dilatation at the base that's also enough and that's also a pretty common finding in these entities and then, of course, we talked about the lateral branching, which is, to me, a pathognomonic feature. Um, oftentimes, the serrations just go up and down the whole length of the crypt. But this is difficult because sometimes, you know, the, the proliferation zone of a hyperplastic polyp can be small. You know, it can just be at the very base. But like I said, in this case, only one crypt base looks involved but that's enough well here it goes down also so the differential between a hyperplastic on the left and the sessile serrated on the right the serrations are more prominent in the top half of a hyperplastic it's got a prominent basal basal zone there are mitoses at the base and no lateral branching and obviously the opposite are, are just true on the right for the sessile straight ups, it's a more complex architecture. They're dilated crypt bases with lateral branching. There's what's called reverse maturation, meaning it's not more, it, the, the base is probably more mature than the top in, in um, sessile serrated, and they can be larger. Um, they're usually larger and they're usually right-sided. So that really is a, an encapsulation of what we've been talking about up to this point. And here's you know some classic examples to again highlight the difference flatter extensions all the way down interesting they oftentimes have an underlying lipoma i don't know why um here you have these these narrow dark uh crypts for the conventional hyperplastic polyp any questions so far you guys are perfectly clear distinguishing the two roosevelt is anybody awake there <laughs> Yeah, you're still awake, <laughs> okay? But no questions. I feel like uh, my only no question is like, um, oftentimes we don't have these beautiful pieces of tissue 
we have really small. I've seen you pointing to the to the base many times, but I found that when we have a little bit of fat underneath, it's easier. Is that because it comes of helps it to orient the like the adipose tissue? Well, I mean. Um, when there's less tissue, it's always going to be more difficult, you know. Um, but usually, even with small pieces, you're going to get, you know, you're usually going to get the whole mucosa, meaning including muscularis mucosa, or at least good chunks of it. You'll be able to distinguish the base of the crypts from the surface. If you can't, that's a problem. If you can't distinguish base of the crypt from the surface, you're going to have a very hard time diagnosing this because that's where the differences arise. That's what that's where the differences are. Well, if you don't have enough to do that, then I, I have a term that I use, hyperplastic polyp with features of sessile serrated, mm -hmm. if I just can't be sure. And it's right-sided, usually. Um, or if it's more convincing, but left-sided. You know, the presence or absence of fat in and of itself, I don't find diagnostic, but... It is. I, it does tend to be more common in the sessile serrated polyps, but I, I haven't really used that as a distinguishing feature. Um, but yeah, definitely, if there's less tissue, it's going to be more difficult, especially if you can't tell up from down. Yeah, that that and that is that does happen definitely. I'm sure it's going to happen to me today. Um, <laughs> but uh, it just doesn't, you know, there's not, sometimes there's nothing you can do. You just have to hedge. Okay. Oh, and this is a, this is a nice picture too. This is, this is really defines it. This is the base. The base of the hyperplastic polyp has mitotic figures. This is what you think of as a typical, you know, base, a basal loom of nuclei. Here, it looks like it's mature, totally mature at the base with some lateral extension. Okay, so then we go on to the topic of a traditional serrated adenoma. I included, it's included here because it has the word serrated in it and it does have these, you know, this um, kind of sawtooth internal contour which defines the gr serrated growth pattern. But these are quite rare. They do, they do occur, I've seen many of them, but they're quite rare. Um, and like I said, it's, it's, it has more of the features of an adenoma than it does of a hyperplastic polyp. They're mostly in the left colon, and the, especially in the rectum. They're often large and have a tubular villus architecture. And they're raised, but rarely pedunculated. And this is what they look like. Um, they're really a good mixture of adenoma and serrations. But they have some other features that are unique to them. Does anybody know what's really unique about a, tr a s traditional serrated adenoma? <coughs> Again, like in the family feud, what are the, some of the top features of, that make traditional serrated adenomas unique? Anybody? Rifat, where are you? <laughs> Studying for board <laughs> Rifat's not there? Any senior, <laughs> any, any senior residents there? Well, Lara's here. <laughs> Dominic's here. So, second unit, who's here? It's, there's something called, it has an eosinophilic mm -hmm. cytoplasm. And you can see it here on low power. It looks kind of like different. You see the serrations, but it also looks pink here, very pink. Mm. Um, so, just to go through it, it's oftentimes villiform. The serrations are complex, like in a sessile serrated polyp. And the, there's dysplasia, like you see in a conventional adenoma. Um, it, the, the dysplasia is usually not as high grade as a conventional adenoma, but it is dysplasia. And it's this eosinophilic pencilate cells that are really, I think, the most unique aspect of this. And I won't call it unless I see this. Here's a higher power showing. It's kind of got this light eosinophilic look. The cells are very the nuclei are very basally oriented and the cytoplasm is markedly hyper, um, eosinophilic. And here's a good high power showing what's known as a pencillate nuclei. I mean, the, and if I compare, I will show you a picture that compares them side by side, but most adenomas do have oval nuclei, but these are more than oval. They're what's known as pencillate. they very tall and thin. And then you have this abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. And that's something that's unique on a cytologic level to the uh, 
traditional serrated adenoma. And here's that comparison. So you can see that the two, two big differences. Conventional adenomas are more hyperchromatic. The nuclei are more hyperchromatic than these are. These kind of are faintly hyperchromatic. And the, instead of having mucin in the cytoplasm like they do in the adenoma, it has this eosinophilic material. And those are the two main differences aside from the serrated architecture between a traditional serrated adenoma and a sporadic or con conventional tubular villus adenoma. And then you have a whole range of other colon polyps just to keep us in the, it's not just um, hyperplastic or serrated versus adenomatous. Um, you have fibroblastic polyps, juvenile polyps, hematomatous polyps, inflammatory polyps, inflammatory fibroid polyps, polyps of nerve sheath origin, and of course the rectal mucosal prolapse, all of which we can see all of these in a week. I mean, that's how many polyps are removed. Even though there's a long list here, you can see all of these in a week to a month. This is obviously taken from a book, but, um, or an article, but I've seen many myself, that this is um, a fibroblastic polyp, which is a proliferation of bland spindle cells in the lamina propria, often associated with hyperplastic changes. So it raises the question, is hyperplastic changes really a neoplasm in and of itself? Probably not. React, they, it's a reactive phenomenon. Whenever you have irritation, probably, of the epithelial cells, they undergo increased proliferation. And because there's no room for them, they form this sawtooth internal contour, sawtooth luminal contour, because there's too many cells being produced due to the irritation. So I don't think hyperplastic or serrated growth pattern in and of itself is indication of neoplasia. It probably is reactive slash neoplastic. Um, which is a hard concept, but I don't know about any way to think of it since w we don't believe these start off as fibroblastic polyps, as hyperplastic polyps, and then develop some kind of scar. These are believed to be fibroblastic polyps first, and, uh, and oftentimes you see admixed hyperplastic epithelium. Um, immunostains for this? Some people consider these maybe perineuriomas and they will stain with GLUT1, GLUT1, and um, so there's still some controversy about that, but I know at Sinai they get GLUT1s on all these, and if they're positive, call them perineuriomas. If they're negative, call them fibroblastic polyps. Um, either way, they're totally benign. This is a juvenile polyp. Juvenile polyps can be confused with inflammatory polyps because they're often ulcerated at the surface, but you can see that the juvenile polyp has, also known as a retention polyp, you know, irregularly shaped, enlarged glands in, in a somewhat inflamed stroma, but it's not completely inflamed. You still get the feeling there's a lamina propria in the background, you know, as opposed to true, in a true inflammatory polyp, which is just granulation tissue. Hematomatous polyp, of course, classically will be in the context of pooch jager syndrome but they can occur sporadically and well, and they, they consistently have this branching, um, the, the branching um, fibromuscular stroma that's characteristic of these hamartomatous polyps that's highlighted on a trichrome stain that the, stains the muscle red. And then this is just an inflammatory polyp, which is basically granulation tissue. Um, this is an inflammatory fibroid polyp which on high power is characterized by small vessels that have concentric, a concentric like, uh, you know, um, a swirling of, of cells around it, oftentimes containing eosinophils, which is a little out of focus, but there are eosinophils in the background. But you, what you want to focus on is that these kind of, these are not granulation tissue vessels, they're better formed. You go back, to granulation tissue vessels, they're much, they have a much more insignificant wall. You know, they're new vessels that are just sprouting. Uh, this looks more well developed in an inflammatory fibropolyp. There's less inflammation, and you know, you have this background milieu and this concentric nature to the inflammation. So, as I mentioned, uh, there was a classic adenoma to carcinoma sequence in in um, 
conventional adenoma to carcinomas. And this was formulated by Bert Vogelstein, like I said, in the late 80s. It, it, it involved, uh, you know, the multi-step, the multi-hit hypothesis. You had some APC mutation and then COX-2 overexpression and KRAS, and you ended up with the conventional tubular villus adenoma, the center of which contains the invasive adenocarcinoma invading the you know the submucosa of this polyp. That's the conventional adenoma to carcinoma sequence, and you know it can even they can even be considered high risk, um, where you assess you know the distance from the polyp base. And in this case, it was at the cauterized margin, but no angiolymphatic invasion. This was how you know this was the conventional idea of how carcinomas arose. But um, in the hyperpla in, in the colon in this new set of evidence, they found it in hyperplastic polyposis, which contained these large polyps, but also had a high incidence of colorectal cancer. I should say that the conventional adenoma to carcinoma sequence was also found in um, familial adenomatous polyposis. Those patients have nearly 100% incidence of colon cancer, um, but more of the conventional type. And they noticed that this was not related to, they didn't find any of the typical chromosome instability that they found with the adenoma, that this was um, oftentimes methylation-induced loss of the MLH1, which is called simp high. Simp high is equivalent to methylation-induced loss of the, uh, the MLH1, which is a mismatch repair gene, mismatch repair gene protein. Um, one of the four that we usually stain for, but MLH1 is the most commonly deleted by hypermethylation. That's the most sensitive to the hypermethylation of the promoter region, which results in its absent expression. And of course, we know that there are some of this some of these have a genetic predisposition, which I'll talk about more. So, as I mentioned earlier, there were individual cases with these serrated, serrated polyps and cancer, um, but um, um, they also noticed, as I said, this parallel body of evidence that there was a high rate of pre-existing hyperplastic polyps, but not conventional adenomas, in patients that had microsatellite unstable cancers, usually arising in the right colon. There was also a large series of microsatellite unstable colorectal cancers that were predated by, pro by proven biopsies, biopsy proven hyperplastic polyps at the same site. So there was this increasing body of evidence. Everything was pointing to a distinct pathway. And then, of course, you saw we actually saw cases like ours. There were transitions in the bi in the biopsy from sessile serrated polyp to dysplasia to carcinoma, and usually loss of MLH1. And they were able to micro dissect these carcinomas and prove that they were microsatellite uh, unstable as they developed carcinoma. They weren't obviously as a sessile serrated polyp, and, you know. And we were asked sometimes. I'm asked, can you do microsatellite unstable? Uh, microsatellite standing on on a polyp I mean that, that generally doesn't work it's it's the cancers that lose the microsatellite staining having said that I think there is some bit of evidence that some adenomas can in, in Lynch syndrome can lose the but it's it's on it's unlikely and I I try to um, dissuade the clinicians from relying on it so this is a good, um, a good schematic which kind of breaks up all colon cancers. This is Jeremy Jass, who's one of the experts. I think he's actually one of the people that Dr. Um, Carlos Cardo Cardo asked to help uh, reorganize our our uh, pathology department. He's a really brilliant guy, and he's a molecular pathologist and a good surgical pathologist, and. This is his schematic, which shows that you have five different types of cancer that can be broken up molecular in, in, based on molecular classification. The biggest is the conventional type, which is microsatellite stable and hypermethylation negative. That's the biggest 
group. Um, the next biggest group would be microsatellite stable, but have a low degree of hypermethylation of uncertain significance. So this is really considered one group. The uh, microsatellite, um, if you have hypermethylation and uh, microsatellite stable, that puts you kind of in an intermediate category. We're not really sure what that means, um, but that is kind of a unique category. And then you have the microsatellite unstable tumors, most of which are hypermethylated, and that's believed to be sporadic. And then you have the, the ones that are not hypermethylated, which are the true HNPCC patients, which account for only 3% of the population, 3% of the cancers. But the point here is that um, we, you know, using the molecular classification, we um, identified a different pathway, and this different pathway often correlated to the serrated polyps. It, which would which would which would be the precursors to type one and to type two and that's why you know that's where this whole concept gained tremendous traction so the conclusions are right-sided hyperplastic polyps are different than left-sided ones um, they're larger they have altered architecture and cytology albeit subtle as we discussed they're associated with microsatellite unstable carcinomas. I didn't really mention this, but they do they can have a shorter interval to development of cancer than a conventional adenoma, um, the microsatellite unstable lesions. And as you actually you can see from that first case, the original case that I showed you, which within the same tumor, you had a pretty poorly differentiated neoplasm. I and mean, that can occur in an adenoma, but generally, you know, the adenomas like I showed you are polypoid and you get one central area of, of invasive carcinoma and it's thought to be pretty slow growing. But um, in, in this case, we had a small polyp that had a poorly differentiated carcinoma in it. So I, I do think this is true. And what is the, what's the significance for prognosis and management? So let's just review. A hyperplastic polyp, they're clinically innocuous. Their follow-up with a true hyperplastic polyp on the left side you know, 10 years till the next um, colonoscopy. Um, but if you have lots of hyperplastic polyps, which are unusual, you should consider the idea of a hyperplastic polyposis syndrome, which as I mentioned, has a 50% risk and, and should be brought back within a year. Um, then this concept of cess, then this um, entity that we basically understand now, sessile serrated polyp, it's the precursor to microsatellite unstable colorectal carcinomas that are hypermethylated basically sporadic <clears throat> and you notice that the Lynch syndrome microsatellite unstables are not precursored by a serrated lesion interestingly enough um, at least that's what this that's what this um, this showed that the serrated pops are only precursors to types 1 and 2 not to the Lynch syndrome um, they should be completely removed, obviously, the sessile serrated polyp. We actually generally don't do this. You know, we don't say sessile serrated polyp without dysplasia, <coughs> but it, I think most clinicians assume that if we don't say it, there's no dysplasia there. And that gets, that's similar to an adenoma that you repeat the uh, endoscopy within three to five years. If there is dysplasia, you know, that's a high risk lesion and you have to repeat again within a year. Uh, and this is a pretty controversial statement, but if you can't remove the whole sessile serrated polyp, consider colectomy. I don't think most surgeons would buy that. Um, I think you have to have some evidence of dysplasia, conventional dysplasia, before you do a colectomy for, you know, a, a, a lesion that you can't remove. Um, I've never seen a colectomy for just a large sessile serrated polyp, uh, but I mean, you never know, but I, I don't think that this is really established. And then traditional serrated adenoma, again, it's treated like an adenoma, has to be removed, and the repeat colonoscopy in three to five years. That's it. I'm done a little early. <laughs>